you take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20 this evening. Revelation chapter 20, we've been in this chapter for a couple of weeks now, um, but there is a great deal that is said that is important as we're looking at the end times and we are looking at uh, specific prophecy related to the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. So Revelation chapter 20, we're going to read the entire chapter uh, as we get going tonight. It says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of men that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, uh, the Old and New Testaments uh, contain numerous references to the kingdom of Christ. The long anticipated time when Jesus is going to return to the earth to rule and reign. Uh, and this is, in fact, one of the more frequently mentioned subjects in, in the scriptures. Uh, there are a number of other things that are addressed time and time again, but the second coming of Christ is addressed in Old and New Testaments repeatedly. Uh, there are many names that are given to this period, including the Kingdom Age, the Age of Peace, the Reign of Christ, and the Millennium. Uh, and this is not to be confused with the eternal state in which there will be a new heaven and new earth, and we are with Christ for eternity. This is a specific set time uh, that the scripture speaks of. Uh, it is a time in which there will be a temporary kingdom on earth that is, uh, uh, trying to find the word, but the mind's gone blank, is, uh, uh, somebody help me out here. Yeah, well, millennial, yeah, but uh, that's not the word I'm looking for. Anyway, rather than take the time, which could take the whole hour, uh, to try and find that word, we'll just carry on. All right, throughout the centuries, uh, every scheme of man 
has been tried to try and forge peace. Uh, we have seen in our lifetime, president after president after president, try to find a peace solution in the Middle East. And all of those have been for naught. Uh, there has been constant breaking of any peace agreement, and it has been chaos. But not just in the Middle East, because man has tried and tried and tried to create a utopian uh, society on this earth. Uh, and they have failed at every attempt. There are two reasons, I think, that are why man's efforts have failed to create that utopian society. First of all, man has a sinful and degenerate heart uh, and cannot produce a world of peace no matter how hard he tries. Uh, we are lost and undone. Uh, we are prone to just wickedness, and there is no way that there is going to be a strong and lasting peace as long as sinful men are involved in the process. Secondly, as long as Satan is roaming the earth, there will always be war. Uh, he is not only a deceiver and a hater of the church and the, the body of Christ, but he is a hater of all men. And he continues to pit nation against nation. And uh, the proliferation of war is one of his accomplishments. Uh, even in this area of the United Nations, um, there is evidence that we have tried and tried and tried and failed repeatedly to bring about peace. The United Nations was established in October of 1945 at the close of World War II, and it was a group of nations that came together for the express purpose of trying to ward off or avoid having a world war such as they've just gone through. With all the tragedies, with all the heartache, with all of the horrible things that have taken place, the United Nations agreed that they would try to work together as a body to keep peace on the earth. Uh, but since its inception, there have been more wars and more bloodshed than at any other comparable time in history. Uh, so man's efforts are useless outside of Christ. So we have uh, heard about and we have talked about and we have longed for that time in which Christ will come to the earth and will set up his millennial kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. The word millennium is a Latin term that basically boils down to a thousand years. Despite the many biblical references to the millennial reign of Christ and despite the fact that Christians will play a vital role in it, there are a lot of believers that really don't understand what the Bible teaches about the millennium. And so what we're going to try to deal with tonight is the millennial kingdom and the great white throne judgment. So we're going to try to, uh, and so that's a tough sell to try and deal with a thousand years of what is going to take place in a 45 minute message, but we're going to do our best. Uh, the 20th chapter of Revelation has been a major battleground of the various basic competing systems of biblical eschatology. Uh, in general, the way that this chapter is interpreted seems to determine how the entire book of Revelation will be understood. Uh, and to a large extent, how biblical prophecy as a whole is understood. Uh, and so we want to uh, just try to look at the different uh, positions in relationship to the thousand year reign of Christ uh, and why they're held or what they believe and why this church holds to a premillennial uh, position. And uh, hopefully we will be able to get that wrapped up this evening. So there are three major views when it comes to the millennial kingdom. 
the first and the one that, that I hold to personally and the one that this church has in its doctrinal statement is a premillennial return of Christ. Uh, that we believe that at the end of the seven years of tribulation, uh, we are going to experience the glorious appearing, the second coming of Christ. And at that time, he is going to establish his millennial kingdom on this earth. All right? Uh, the premillennial position holds to the basic premise that Christ will return bodily prior to the thousand year millennial period. This view is accepted by nearly all Bible scholars that take the scriptures literally. Uh, and early Christians in the early church were unquestionably premillennial in their position. The disciples and those that they taught anticipated the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom upon earth during their lifetime. That's what they looked for. That's what they expected to take place. And we know it didn't happen. We know that uh, those early believers passed off the scene. Uh, and there are a lot of detractors to the premillennial position today. There are many that, that argue that premillennialism is a relatively new belief system. But uh, it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because we see it in the early church. We see uh, in the first three centuries of Christendom, we see that the church as a whole believed in the imminent return of Christ, that he would come to this earth physically and set up his kingdom, and then there would be the thousand years. But uh, after that first three centuries of church history, uh, there came into being a system of belief or interpretation by which theologians began to interpret the scriptures allegorically, uh, with signs and symbols being the primary method of interpreting scripture. Uh, Premillennialism believes that the rapture, the tribulation, and the glorious appearing will all occur before the millennium begins. And that during the millennium, Satan will be bound for that thousand year period. And a theocratic kingdom will be established on this earth with peace as its main uh, characteristic. All right. Uh, toward the end of the third century, this allegorical approach began to creep into the church and it began to dominate uh, theological beliefs and, and thought. And allegorical interpretation of scripture is still prominent today. There are still many people that will look at the book of Revelation <coughs> excuse me, and interpret it simply by signs and symbols that this isn't what John is saying. He's saying something bigger or broader. And they'll read into scripture things that are not necessarily there. Uh, in the early history of the church, as this allegorical method of interpretation came into being, philosophy also started to creep into the church. And it replaced the study of the scriptures. And premillennialism fell into disrepute. It was no longer accepted because the academics said that allegorical was better than literal interpretation. So uh, late in the 19th century, and, and I apologize, some of this stuff is going to be like, but late in the 19th century, Bible institutes and Christian schools began once again to emphasize a literal interpretation of Scripture. And once they began to get back to the literal interpretation of Scripture, premillennialism began to be taught once again. So that is uh, the nutshell 
of premillennialism and the fact that we as a church hold to that position because we believe in a literal interpretation of Scripture. The second position is amillennialism. Amillennialists do not believe in a literal kingdom on earth uh, following the second coming of Christ. They tend to spiritualize and allegorize the prophecies concerning the millennium and attribute yet unfulfilled prophecies related to Israel to the church. Uh, and many amillennialists believe that the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic timetable. Uh, we do not hold to that. We believe that God has a plan for Israel and God has a plan for the church. We have not replaced the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. So those who hold to the amillennial view also believe that Satan was actually bound at the time that Christ first came to the earth, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and I, I don't know about you folks, but I'm thinking that unless I'm not seeing something properly, Satan couldn't have been bound for that thousand years of that 2,000 years because the world has really gotten horrible over the last couple thousand years. Right? Am, am I, I just, sometimes my thinking is not normal, right? So I, I just need to check it against the experts that are gathered here tonight. Uh, furthermore, adherence of the amillennial position differ as to whether the millennium is being spiritually fulfilled currently on this earth or whether it's being fulfilled by the saints in heaven. Uh, there are some really difficult things to try and reason through with the amillennial position. Those who hold to this position do not adhere to a simpler and plain and literal interpretation of Scripture, but rather they spiritualize and they allegorize the, uh, the teachings or the prophecies of Scripture. The third position is one that has pretty much fallen out of acceptability, and that is post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is uh, the most recent of the three millennial views, and it was almost extinct by the middle of the 20th century. So those who hold to this perspective believe that the world will get better and better and better until the entire world is Christianized, at which time Christ will return to a kingdom that is already flourishing in peace. Anybody watch the news tonight? Because I'm confident that the world is not getting better and better and better. If anything, it's getting scarier and scarier every day that we live. This view was popular at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, but it was all but eliminated as a result of the World Wars, the Great Depression, and the overall escalation of evil in this society. Uh, but there are a handful of people that still hold to a post-millennial view. So we want to look at what the millennium actually is. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. In those six verses, the thousand-year reign of Christ is actually referred to six different times. Uh, many today dispute the notion that Christ's kingdom will last a literal thousand years. And some would take that thousand years, and as mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, and would try to spiritualize it, that it's symbolic of something else. But to do that is to throw into question a large amount of scripture. Uh, because if we take that thousand years and try to spiritualize it or try to say that it is symbolic of something else, then we have to look at every other number, not only in the book of Revelation, but in all of scripture and say, is that also spiritualized, right? We have uh, list after list after list of uh, where Christ and John in the book of Revelation speaks of different numbers. 
And uh, we have to be careful when we're looking at anything other than a literal interpretation of Scripture. Uh, and wherever possible, prophecy is meant to be interpreted literally in a straightforward manner. So there are at least four reasons for taking the literal number 1,000 as it is given in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. First of all, uh, John and other biblical writers knew how to use indefinite concepts when they wanted to. Uh, an example of that is Matthew 25 and verse 19, Revelation 20, verses 3 and 8. Here, however, John does not use an indefinite concept, but rather he employs a definite expression, a, a specific number. Uh, and that is an important thing to keep in mind. Secondly, in the Greek New Testament, when a number is associated with the word year or years, this linguistic combination always refers to a literal duration of time. So why should the six-fold repetition of 1,000 years be the sole interpretive exception to this rule? It always refers to a period of time. So we can't take this thousand years that is spoken of in Revelation 20 and try to say that it's symbolic of something else. It refers to 1,000 years. Thirdly, if the number 1,000 here is not literal, and we've already alluded to this, how then do we interpret all of the other numbers in the book of Revelation? such as the two witnesses in chapter 11 and verse 3, or the 7,000 people that are spoken of in 11, chapter 11, verse 13, or the four angels in chapter 7 and verse 1, or the seven angels in chapter 8 and verse 6, or the 144,000 that are chosen to be evangelists in chapter 7 and verse 4, or the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel in chapter 7, verses 5 through 8, or the 24 elders, or the 42 months, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, for us to say that the thousand years spoken of in chapter 20 is anything other than a thousand years throws the rest of Scripture into confusion and into question. And so we need to stick to that literal interpretation. And fourthly, not everything in the book of Revelation is a symbol. Uh, if you turn to Revelation chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, A revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. If you look at that word signified, it has the word sign right in it. And so many people look at the book of Revelation and say that it is a book of signs and symbols. It is a book that is, is uh, uh, spiritualized and it, that nothing is really what it says to be. But in fact, a lot of it is exactly what God wants us to know and what is intended uh, by the writer. So why are we looking at a millennium? Some have questioned why God would establish a thousand year reign on earth before ushering in the new kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. They try to reason that it would make more sense to bypass the millennium and instead to immediately usher in the eternal state in Revelation 21 and 22. But there are three reasons, I think, for God allowing the revelation or the, mo the millennium. Number one, during the millennium, God will fulfill previously made promises involving the present earth. God has promised uh, the Jews and Israel as a nation and the church will one day rule a political kingdom upon this earth. Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, and Revelation 12, uh, verse 5. Uh, we also see 
that because of these promises, either directly or indirectly involve the present earth, that they must be fulfilled before the present earth is destroyed and replaced with a new heaven and new earth. Secondly, the millennial reign of Christ will illustrate that God, uh, that only God's rule over sinful men can result in lasting peace. It will drive home the fact that peace is not possible outside of Jesus Christ, outside of his rule and reign. Because men have tried it, they've tried it through all human history and they have failed miserably. But in that thousand year period when Christ is ruling and reigning, there will be peace on the earth. And thirdly, the millennial reign of Christ will demonstrate that man's depravity emanates from his heart and not from his environment. The interesting thing is that during the millennium period, there are going to be people being born. And there are going to be unsaved people that are populating this world. And uh, in fact, at the end of the thousand year reign, when Satan is released from his chains for that brief period of history, he is going to try and raise up a rebellion with these people and rebel against the rule of Christ. And he's going to fail miserably. But we are told by criminologists and by social workers uh, and by humanism and by psychology that man is corrupt and evil because his environment is corrupt and evil. That uh, the way a person is brought up determines their behavior or their attitude or the way that they conduct themselves as an adult. Uh, but that's not what the Bible teaches at all, right? I mean, those things can contribute to a person going sideways and off the rails. But the real problem is the heart. And the thousand year reign of Christ is going to demonstrate that ever so powerfully, that man's depravity comes from the heart and not from his environment because the environment of everyone living in that millennium period is going to be a perfect environment. I'm gonna be surrounded by peace Christ himself is ruling and reigning. Uh, there is no poverty. There is no crime. There is no addiction. There is no spousal abuse. There is nothing in that society that could corrupt or dra drag down an individual. But evil lurks in the heart of man, right? And even in a utopian society, Evil can still raise its ugly head. It'll be like the Garden of Eden. It will be. Yeah. That's what it yeah. So while these factors uh, of our environment can com compound the problem, Scripture explains that man's wickedness stems from a sinful heart that he inherited from Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. Thus, man's depravity is internal rather than external in its cause, all right? It, it comes from the heart. That's why we're told time and time again in Scripture to guard our heart, all right? Proverbs says guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life. We tend to sin. We are drawn to sin. We tend to wander away from Christ. We tend to pursue those things which are not proper and right and holy. And the only lasting solution for curing the wickedness of the world for people is to be given a new nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8 and verse 9. And the new birth in John chapter 3. That we are to come to faith in Christ. And once that happens and we have a new nature, then things are different. That doesn't mean we're perfect. But in this thousand year period, things are going to be pretty much perfect, all right? And we are going to be in a society that is going to be the dream society that everyone has always wanted. But we are uh, at the end of this thousand years. Now, let me back up. Let's go back to the rapture. 
Once a rapture occurs, you and I as believers are going to stand before Christ and we're going to be judged based on what we have done from the moment we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. That is where we will be judged. And that will be for a loss or gain of reward. Doesn't mean you're going to be cast into hell because you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were his child. You cannot lose your salvation. You cannot be bad enough. Not that we would ever want to be. But we cannot be severed from the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. So we will be judged based on what we have done from the moment we trusted Christ until we stand before him. Then there will be the seven years of tribulation. Then there will be the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ. Then the millennial kingdom is set up. And at the end of the millennial kingdom, we then have the great white throne judgment. Who is a great white throne judgment for? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. Those who have died throughout history that have rebelled against God, that have rejected Christ, will stand before God. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And the Bible is very clear that there is a judgment day coming for everyone. The most sobering passage in the Bible is Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, which says this. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad that one day you came to that realization that you needed Jesus Christ Amen. and you place your faith and trust in him and he has made us new creatures that we are his child. We have been adopted into the family of God and though we will be present and witness to this, we will not be judged as these are. All right. These are judged based on the fact that they rejected Christ and they are doomed to eternity in hell. Our status in Christ determines how we will be judged. Immediately following the rapture, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. And there all the resurrected saints will receive their rewards for the works that they've done while on the earth. And this will be far different than what is going to happen in Revelation chapter 20 when the unbelievers and the dead from all of history are resurrected and stand before God at this great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 depicts a scene of severe judgment. Uh, and after the millennium, Satan is going to be released for a short time. And he will decide... At that time that he is going to rebel one final time against Christ and he will deceive many into joining him in that attempt to battle against God. But Revelation 20 tells us that fire will fall from heaven and devour the followers of Satan. And Satan himself will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. And then the unsaved dead of all time will appear before the great white throne judgment. Uh, and folks, that's what we do not want our friends and loved ones to have to do. We do not want people that we know, people that we care about, to die in their sin without Christ and one day stand before God at this white, great white throne judgment. Uh, because there's no hope then. There is no backpedaling. There's no making a decision at the last moment. It is too late. At that time and so we need to do everything in our power 
And I believe that one of the benefits of studying prophecy is that it spurs us to live for Christ in this present day. That it, it motivates us to be witnesses. That it, it, in some cases, it scares us to the point that we are forced to tell people that we care about, about Jesus Christ. You know, uh, it is true that around the world, the church is experiencing uh, untold persecution. And Christians are being tortured for their faith, and Christians are dying for their faith. But yet, in those countries where that's taking place, these people will not be quiet. They continually tell others about Jesus. They continually share their faith. They continually make every effort to evangelize that they can. And in North America, God forgive us, but in North America, we keep quiet because we don't want to offend someone. Or we don't want them to think poorly of us. And so we are quiet. Uh, but when you read Revelation 20 and you read of what is coming for those who die without Christ, uh, it is sobering to say the least. All right, so I'm wrapping things up a little early tonight. So are there any questions or comments or? Just the one question here. I'm just getting back up to all Millennium theology. It's better known, I guess, by uh, replacement theology, right? Replacement, replacement theology is what theology. It's, what's the popular term at this yeah, time. Yeah, where Israel, uh, the church... Uh, the church has replaced, replaced Israel. Israel. Yeah. Dean, did you have your hand up? Yeah, we are, uh, we're with him. On horseback. There will be people that will, there will be believers that make it through to the end of the tribulation that will be witness to the second coming of Christ. But there, and there will be unsaved people that are, yeah. No, there will be um, unsaved people that make it into the millennium. It's it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around, but babies are born and yeah. because we will be made new but there, there will still be sin nature in those who are born uh, during the millennial period and there will be those who have been unsaved at the time the millennium begins who are still alive will still possess that sin nature so they I'm sorry it's okay There will still be a heart problem in those people, yes. But because God himself is ruling, there will be complete order and peace. And they're not being influenced by Satan because they're not really influenced by Yeah. And at the end of the thousand years, when Satan is released, he will influence.
believe that that will be the answer even at that time, yes. Yeah. Reinhardt, did you have your hand up? I'm almost Is afraid it? for you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, now th those are two different terms that, that describe uh, different events, but basically the same position. We are pre-trib in that we believe the rapture of the church will occur before the tribulation. So we are a pre-trib church, all right, in our theological position, that the rapture will occur before the tribulation begins. And again, that goes back. There are different positions on the tribulation. There's a mid-trib rapture. There's a post-trib rapture. Uh, but we believe the church will be taken out before the tribulation begins because we are saved from wrath. We are premillennial, which refers to the second coming. We believe the second coming of Christ will occur before the millennium is established. We return with him when he returns to establish his millennial kingdom. And you stay here a thousand years. I'm planning on staying for the thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> I might do some traveling, <laughs> but Danny. Why is Satan really the <laughs> Somebody's gonna ask that question. <laughs> The simple answer is this. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Other than that it is uh, one final ultimate victory over Satan. I, I don't, I, you know, and I've, I've often wondered, and I'm sure it's got to be in books somewhere, that somebody's theory that I... I can't tell you. I, um, and, and, I, and I've looked for the signs and I can't find it, but I have heard that the reason for that was that Jesus returned to cut short the tribulation period because this world would have destroyed itself. And that tiny little space that was cut short is the time that Satan is, is released to fulfill that seven years. So you knew the answer before you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to put me on the spot. <laughs> well, I thought maybe you knew where, they were, where, the, where it was in Scripture, but for some reason, that was the way it was taught. And because that, it was cut short. Tribulation period was cut short. Or the world would have destroyed itself. That's why Jesus returned. There, there is a... Um, there is a period of 72 days that I believe that is uh, what a lot of people will point to, that if you count up the months and you figure out everything that is in Daniel's prophecy and everything that's in Revelation and everything that's in Matthew, uh, you take all the prophecies together, there are 72 days that are kind of unaccounted, unaccounted for. Uh, what one writer that I've just read over the last few weeks said was that he believes that those 72 days are actually accounted for after the second coming so that when Christ returns to the earth and, and lands on the Mount of Olives and splits the Mount of Olives that for 72 days Uh, there is going to be a period of cleanup and everything that's taking place from all of the millions of bodies. And then, after those 72 days, then the Millennial Kingdom will be established. I, I don't know, and, and to be honest with you, I think that anybody who says they have it down pat hasn't got a clue what they're talking about. I think that because we are dealing with unknowns, and, and uh, 
we can't say unequivocally that this is what is going to happen. We take what we understand from Scripture, but there are still unknowns that we can't. Lynn. You know, didn't we have a conversation about this, Earl, about that thousand years? And I can't stand here and say, no. Nope. Uh, <laughs> but we know that we know that God is outside of time. Yeah. Yeah. So a thousand years for us. Yeah, we are bound by time where God isn't. Uh, and we measure things in 24-hour periods and seven-day weeks and 31-day months and 12-month years where God doesn't do that. So, I mean, there are so many things that are possible uh, when it comes to future events. So that's it. Yeah, well, true. Oh, oh, Dean. There's some things that we'll never know until we get to heaven. We might not even know when we get to heaven. But there's some things that the Bible says nobody knows, not even the angels. As long as we're saved and we're sharing Christ with people. Yeah, one of the one of the gospel writers said that if all of the things that Christ had done were to be written in books that the books could not contain. There is so much about the life of Christ we don't know. There is so much about the teaching of Christ that we don't know. I believe that God has given us everything that we need to know in these 66 books, these two testaments, this one holy Bible. He's given us everything that we in this modern age need to be aware of. But there's a lot about our God that we don't know. Amen. You know? Uh, Mark. Yeah, in regards to time and how much the Lord loves us, when you look at the 6,000 years he's been waiting for us to get it right. And uh, so God has 66 days. Yep. You know? And then on the seventh day, he's going to rest. But the thing that really boggles my mind is the love that Jesus Christ had for us. And when we're going to get raptured and we go. an action movie. <laughs> We're going to be living it. It's exciting stuff. I, you know, like, I know that it, I know that it boggles the mind. And let me tell you, uh, I, I think I've shared this before. I am much more comfortable preaching than I am teaching. Uh, and this is a challenging subject to try and teach because, uh, there is a lot of speculation because people don't really know. There are firmly held beliefs that people will fight you over when it comes to prophecy. Uh, and there is just uh, so much information. Uh, and this puny mind has a tough time computing all of the information. Uh, but it is exciting to study. Uh, someday when I retire, I'm going to downsize my library. 
but I've already decided that I'm keeping all of my revelation and prophecy books. I'm not parting with them. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to need, but I want to keep that stuff because this is so important because the study of the book of Revelation brings with it a promise of God's blessing. Right? So we need to be in this, this book, and we need to be studying it, and we need to understand it to the best of our ability, even though it's overwhelming by times. It's exciting. Because when you see the bad headlines on the television or in the newspaper, uh, what was it, Marlene, that you said? Somebody said that Yeah, we think that everything's falling apart, but everything's falling into place, exactly as God wants it to be. So uh, let's all stand and do rapture practice. <laughs> all right? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening and for the opportunity to come and study your word and share our request and pray with each other. God, we thank you for the freedom we enjoy and help us to be diligent in utilizing that freedom in these end times to be able to tell others the good news of the gospel. Father, you are uh, a sovereign God. You are over, over the affairs of mankind and you know the beginning from the end. And Father, we look at things today and it can be a little uh, troubling. But Father, I pray that you'd help us as we look at the book of Revelation and we look at prophecy throughout the Bible, that we would understand that your plan is falling into place. And all we have to do is wait for the trumpet sound. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be busy until that day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.